Hallelujah. Good morning, everyone. Hallelujah. We uh, are so glad to have, have you with us today. I trust you've been refreshed. And uh, we're just, there's nothing that can take the place of the fellowship of faith. And uh, you gotta have faith friends. <laughs> you gotta have faith friends because there's sometimes that you need to call on those faith friends to make some journeys with you. Right? And uh, the man on that was let down through the roof, uh, he was grateful that day for faith friends. <laughs> Amen. That would take him places that other people wouldn't be interested in participating in. And uh, you got to have faith friends that will go places with you. When others say, that doesn't make sense, and, and your faith friends will say, let's do it. <laughs> right? Let's do that. <laughs> well, I don't have money, do you? No, let's go. <laughs> Right? Because all of those things are just non, they're non-issues. They're non-issues. And with faith friends, you don't have to explain. <laughs> if you got to explain, you need different friends. <laughs> right? And uh, faith friends are the best friends. Not only that, they, they fellowship with you by faith. <laughs> they look past all your flesh and all your naturalness, and they see the gold in you, and they seek it out to be with you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some people call for more of our faith than others, but... <laughs> You don't want to be around those that once you're done, all your faith is spent, but they drain your faith. No, no, but you got to have faith friends. What is it? You got to have friends. What is that? Anybody, what is that song from? Anybody know? You say, that, that sounded so bad. We don't even know what that song. It might have been a local Oklahoma song. Yeah, it might have been. Yeah, one we made up when we didn't have friends. <laughs> oh, well, a room full of faith friends right here. And I tell you what, it makes the running so fun, doesn't it? <clears throat> you don't want to be running with people that are tripping. <laughs> they'll trip you up. <laughs> yeah, they'll trip you up. You've seen it in a marathon. You've seen it on TV. Even in the Olympics, somebody takes off, and they're, they're so skilled at running, but they trip, and they trip three people around them. And it's like, brother, get away from me. <laughs> so running the faith race, you're sure-footed. I said, you're sure-footed. You're not one day in doubt, one day in, in, in mental ascent, one day. Faith friends, that their, their steps are, are secure. And, amen. Why? Because they're founded on the Word. Hallelujah. Thank God for the faith of God that's in us. His own faith. It's in us. Amen. The same faith that created the universe, it's in us. Amen. Not just, not, hum, not just human faith, the God kind of, the God, the faith of God. Think about that. The faith of God is in us, not earned. He just gave it to us. He gave us that beginning measure at the new birth and we're feeding it and we're, and we're causing it to grow strong and increase. Amen. Hallelujah. Turn with me to third John verse two. I'm just going to uh, I had it in my heart to minister along the line of uh, finances and prosperity today. And uh, there's just some things. We turn it hard. We turn the financial flow, the prosperity flow hard. He made it easy. And the reason, and I, I'm, I'm going to address today why I believe so many turn it hard. 
uh, and how to just turn it so easy. I want to read a couple of quotes. I love this. We were in the back room last year when uh, Dr. Bill Winston was with us for our ladies' conference. Don't you like that when Dr. Bill Winston was with us for our ladies' conference? <laughs> and we turned it into a ladies' and men's conference. And it was so funny because Grant said, because Grant, my son, does the graph, uh, a lot of the graphic design. And so we were working on the, the, the uh, ads and stuff. And he's, I said, well, Dr. Winston is coming. And I said, so put ladies' and men's conference. And he said, well, why are you saying that? Just say conference. <laughs> And I said, because it was supposed to be a lady, so put it in parentheses, and men's. <laughs> so people don't think we backed up. We didn't back up. We just went further. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. Oh, I know, I know, I know. So when Dr. Bill Winston was with us for our ladies and men's conference, um, we were in the back room, and he got to talking at the dinner table about finances and about believing God. And he made this statement. He said, increase doesn't come by time. It comes by truth. Mm. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Increase doesn't come by time. It comes by truth. Amen. Amen. And then he made this statement. Money is a mean master. It will try to intimidate you and you have to show it who's boss. Oh, Amen. Money is a mean master. It will try to intimidate you, and you have to show it who's boss. And then uh, Morgan, there's Morgan. Morgan said this. It's so good. She said, where you invest your time and money shows where you think your prosperity flows from. Where you invest your time and money shows where you think your prosperity flows from. My husband made this statement, don't look at the need, but look at the supply. There is no need bigger than God's affection for you. Don't look at the need, but look at the supply. There is no need bigger than God's affection for you. And then he said this, my husband said, when Jesus was in hell, there was a supply to get him out. <laughs> So your car payment is not as bad as going to hell. There is a supply. <laughs> and if there was a supply to raise Jesus, there's a supply to raise anything in your life. Amen. And then I love this by Brother Copeland. You water your seed with praise. Yeah, because we sow it, but we need to water it. Amen. Third John verse two says, beloved, I wish above all things we could say this, uh, this uh, men were, they wrote as they were moved upon by the Holy Ghost. So when he says, I wish or I desire, we could say this, this is the desire of heaven for us. This is the desire of the Holy Ghost. The desire for your prosperity did not begin with you. Amen. You're not the first one for your life to desire prosperity. God did. So he planned it. I desire, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospers. This, for, this phrase, soul prospering, is simply the same thing Paul said, your mind renewed. Amen. As your mind is renewed. So many times when people fall behind financially, they go out and try to add money to them when they need to add the renewing of the mind because Bible prosperity comes from the renewing of the mind. Not, it doesn't come from it. It attracts it. Because prosperity already belongs to you. But the renewing of the mind will move into what belongs to it because you'll see you're not trying to get money. Amen. That's right. That's right. Amen. You're not trying to get the prosperity that is yours. Right. Right. You're walking in the light of what is yours. Uh, money does not mean we're prosperous. Right. We're prosperous because of who we belong to. We're prosperous because we are in Christ. And all prosperity 
is him. Amen. But because we're prosperous, it's not money that makes us prosperous. It's not homes. It's not businesses. It's not income that makes us prosperous. But because we are prosperous in him, all the money must come. All the businesses must come. The, the prosperity of who we are in Christ attracts everything to us. It's not these things out here that make us prosperous. The prosperity is in us. It is us. And that, when you understand that, you are a magnet to every need being supplied. The supply must come. Amen. Because I'm prosperous, the home must come. Because I'm prosperous, the business must come. Because I'm prosperous, the customers must come. They don't make me prosperous. The prosperity is me. One with him. And that's why we turn it hard. We treat prosperity as something out here that makes us look like we're increasing. And we got to gather out from out here and draw it to us when the prosperity is in us. It's who we are. And we are the magnet for everything we need to come. Tweak it. Tweak the thinking. Amen. Uh, we will never prosper beyond our mental capacity. We'll never prosper beyond our thought life. If we're behind financially, we're behind in the renewing of the mind. We're not behind financially. It's only showing up in our finances. The lack of the renewing of the mind will show up in the finances. It will show up in the health. It will show up in the marriage. It will show up in every arena of life. But as the mind is renewed, it will show up in the finances. It will show up in the health. It will show up in every arena of life. It's about the renewing of the mind. It's about, you say, what do you mean by renewing of the mind? Finding out who you are in Christ. Thinking like God, uh, knowing what he's made yours, who you are, and saying, that's who I am. That's yeah. the way I live. That's Amen. the way I talk. Yeah. That's the way I walk. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. 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 I don't struggle with money. Amen. You want to know why? I don't think about it. I don't think about it. That's good. You start thinking about money and it'll sit on you. Those thoughts will try to sit on you and you're not sitting on them anymore. They're sitting on you. I don't think about money. That's why so many people struggle because they're absorbed with money. They're absorbed with numbers. Ignore the zeros. You say... Um, I, I want to read to you 2 Samuel because this is so, so good. 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 7. In this passage, um, David had sinned in his, how he uh, engaged with Bathsheba. She belonged to another man. And... Uh, David took her to himself and had her husband killed and covered it with a, a battle. But he put her husband on, had her husband put on the front line so that he would get removed. And Nathan the prophet comes to him by the Spirit of God and exposes what he's done. And I'm not going to speak of the whole passage there because that's not the message this morning, but I, I did want you to see this, this wording here. Second Samuel chapter 12, verse 7, Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. This is the Amplified Classic. The King James says, Thou art the man. Talking about you're the one I'm referring to in this parable I gave you that wronged another man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, now look, this is what God is saying to him. I anointed you, king of Israel. I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house. I gave you your master's wives under your bosom. I gave you the house of Israel. I gave you the house of Judah. 
So God started listing everything he did made his. And listen to this. And if that had been too little, I would have had, I would have added that much again. In other words, I would have doubled all of that. If all of that was not enough for, to fulfill your desire, that didn't have to be the limit. I would have, just if you would have asked, I would have doubled all of that. But what did David do? He went and tried to add for himself. And when he went to add for himself, he began violating. When you add to yourself, you're going to have to violate something. You may violate another man trying to get ahead in your business, promotion, step on somebody, deal slyly underhand with your finances, withhold from what belongs to another man. Or you may even violate your own life if you don't violate another man. But violation will take place. Because you cannot add increase without you violating something. You say, what do you mean violating myself? To cause yourself to do all you can to add financial increase, many people end up neglecting their spiritual life, neglecting their church life, stealing from their family life. They're robbed from another arena to increase this financial arena. And the greatest thing to violate, if you're going to seek to acquire finances, is to violate the plan of God in your life. That's the most dangerous thing, to violate, that you lay down the plan of God so that you can become a, if you're called to five-fold ministry, and you lay that down so that you can become a businessman and get a, fo a financial portfolio, you violated the plan of God. Amen. Happens all the time. Happens all the time. A cheap exchange. You know, the, the, as kids, uh, I remember when I was little, and I did it with my boys, they had something that we paid maybe a little bit for, and they got around their friend, and they swapped it out for... Oh. Yeah. Some little yeah. plastic something, a compass that doesn't yeah. work. Yeah. And you go, yeah. I spent 60 bucks yeah. on that watch, and you traded it for a 50-cent broken compass. They saw this big sucker on a stick. <laughs> They saw you coming. <laughs> to trade out the plan of God for a business portfolio. Somebody saw you coming. I am the prosperous and you can't buy that out of me. You cannot, you cannot bid that out of me for something to exchange it for. I am the prosperous. And it's not a house that did it. And it's not an income that did it. It's who I belong to. And he will add anything to me. And if what I have is not enough, he'll double it. He will double it. And if that's not enough, he will double it again. The, the doubling never stops. That's why we like on Thursday night, double up. <laughs> because double up is God's plan for anyone who reaches for more. If you reach the right direction. And David was full in his treasury. He was full in everything else, but he decided, I can add this to my life. And when he did... It cost him. 
because Nathan said there's three, one of three judgments you're going to get to choose from. And it didn't just affect him. It affected his nation. When he began to add for himself, when we step aside from the plan of God to try to add what the world calls financial success and business success, when we step away from the plan of God to do that, it's not just us that's going to suffer. Family members will suffer. Our local church will suffer. Amen. It will cost somebody more than you. When you're, the, when you're in charge of your household, it's going to cost something to lay aside the plan of God and to go after what the world applauds. Why do people do that? Their minds aren't renewed. They do not yet understand who they are, what they have, and what they can do through the greater one in them. Now, I must say this in this time of economy. I don't know where people get off on the idea that you got free money. Because when they handed you free money, you had to lay down right thinking. I'm not saying you shouldn't have taken it. I'm saying you should have stocked it up, stored it up and st instead of not working. That is not a license to not bring your supply. God will bless what you set your hand to. God blesses what you set your hand to. And I don't care who hands you money, you're never dismissed from setting your hand to something. Amen. You notice that pe people can get the idea, well, if I'm prosperous, then I don't have to work. You have the, a plan of God to fulfill. He supplies you with abundance so that you're not chasing provision and you're focused on the plan, going after the plan. When a man becomes, he's elected president of the United States, he has all of these provisions just added to him. He doesn't have to mow his lawn. He doesn't have to go shopping. He doesn't have to pay his bills. He's got secretaries. He's got everything to handle something else. Everything, why? To free him up for the office. That's why God has made us rich, to free us up for his plan, to free us up for his plan so that we're not spending our time, spending our lives going after provision. Our interest is the provision of the plan. The provision of the plan because my life gets funded in the plan. How easy this is. If we were to see the president out with a weed eater going along the edge of his lawn, everyone driving by would say, what's the matter with him? Why? We did not elect him to go out and use the weed eater on Saturday mornings. He needs to be in the office taking care of the people's business. And I would have to say when Christians are out missing church, to work double hours, do all this thing. We go, what's the matter? Why are you out doing what God has already made provision for and neglecting what he provided you for? For the office, whatever God's called you to. I'm not just talking to fivefold. This is not a fivefold minister's message. Every single one of you, there's a plan. Get in the plan, and the plan will require your hand. You got to put your hand to something. No one should be supporting you because the plan will support you. But only as you've got your hand to the plan. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I love uh, something Brother Copeland says. He says, the will of God is my wealthy place. And people are trying to get wealth when it's all connected to the plan. 
No amount of business dealings would ever increase my life like being in the plan. Amen. No matter how many businesses someone could own, yeah. how much income and how many customers they could acquire, nothing will increase them like living the plan. Amen. 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 When people exchange the plan of God for something of a natural, it's because they're money-minded instead of plan-minded. Yeah, Praise the Lord. When we are plan minded, that plan lifts us into the flow of abundance that is connected to the plan. The abundance is with the plan. Amen. Step in the plan and you step in the abundance. Leave the plan, you leave the abundance. I love something Pastor Ike preaches. He says, the only thing that will make a man's life great is the plan of God. That's the only thing that will, will fulfill a man on the inside. Because so many people want to do something that matters. That's good. But it's the plan of God that matters. Amen. One day, every one of us will stand before, before Jesus and he'll say, what did you do with my plan? What did you do with it? Amen. Well, I started a business. Well, that wasn't in my plan, so I'm asking you, what is, what'd you do with my plan? Now, starting a business may be in the plan of God for some people's lives, but not if you're called to fivefold. Amen. Now, don't misunderstand me. My husband, God told my husband, he said, uh, and I won't tell the whole thing, but he, he told him, I'll permit you to have a business. But he only permitted him to as long as he kept the plan first and foremost. But my husband didn't have a business because he wasn't making it. Right. He was funneling it toward different aspects of the ministry. Because he said, I've told other people to do it and they won't do it. And God said, so I'm going to give you your own. That's what God said. He said, I've, I've spoken to so many businessmen to do something for your ministry, and they won't, so I'm just going to give you the business itself. Why? Well, what they could have had, you got. Amen. Because they wouldn't, fund, they wouldn't do the right thing with the funds. Amen. <clears throat> Whenever um, God told me that, I hope you don't get tired of hearing about the miracle of God giving me Sister Amy's castle because I'm going to keep hearing it. I'm going to keep telling it. And you're going to keep hearing it. <laughs> because anything that God did is worth, worth telling over and over and over and over and over. And when he talked to me and he said, I'm going to give you Sister Amy's castle, I said, uh, God, I said, is it wisdom for me? It will take all of my money because when I go to buy that, I'm not buying a castle. I'm buying a renovation. <laughs> I'm buying a maintenance. I'm buying an ongoing project. So it's not a one-time purchase. And I said to him, I said, being a widow, I said, is that wisdom for me to take that money? I could have taken that money and paid off my current home and be completely debt free. But you're telling me to take the money and add more responsibility. But listen, faith is not trying to shirk responsibility. It's fulfilling the plan. Some people just want to get out from under the responsibility. But if you do, your faith will, your faith will waver because your faith needs responsibilities. It needs something. When you don't have any responsibilities, you relax your faith. You relax your faith. So it's not a faith mentality to say, I just don't want that responsibility anymore. And so I said to God, because when I go this direction... It's not just a one-time expense. I could just pay off my current home and owe nothing, nobody, no nothing. But God wanted me to use what I have to move me into greater faith. You understand? Taking the money that I had purchased me the opportunity for greater faith. Why? Because it put a demand on my faith. And so uh, I said to him, I said, is it wisdom for me to take the money that I have and do that? Because it will take all of it. Uh -huh. 
for a time to come. <laughs> and he said to me, the money is for the plan. That's key. The money is for the plan. It's, the money isn't for me just to save and avoid the plan. Just so I can say I've got a nest egg. Nest eggs are fine. I believe in them. I got them. I'm going to keep growing mine. But the money is first and foremost for the plan. So I don't try to save the money at the injury of the plan. I don't try to save the money at the withholding from what the plan calls for. Amen. Amen. When I know something is the plan of God, that's all I need to move forward. I don't need money to move forward. I need to know, is it the plan? If it's the plan, I can, I can jump full-footed in the forward direction when I know it's the plan. Because all the money is for the plan, and all the money I need will come for the plan. Many have stepped back from the plan of God because their mindset is, I'm saving money. But they're, they're cheating the plan. My husband and I would take, when we built this building, you love the banking industry, the mindset, because we bought the property, there's nothing on it. So we went to get a loan to buy the building, and they said, we won't loan you money without a structure on the property. Yes, that's what we're trying to do. <laughs> we don't need a loan if we have the structure on the property. <laughs> you know? Anyway, it's just kind of comical. So they wouldn't loan it because we didn't have a structure. <laughs> so Ed tried every avenue, and the only thing that was available was a high-interest loan that was, that was the only route. And I mean a high interest. And Ed said, we'll do it. Other people have said, I'm not going to pay high interest. Well, are, is it about the money or is it about the plan? I will pay whatever I have to pay to see that plan fulfilled. Because I am not put on the earth to save money. I'm put on the earth to fulfill a plan. And there are people who would say, well, I wouldn't have done that. I would have saved the money, but you'd have forfeited the plan. We got the, we got the, the building built quickly and refinanced it to a low interest. And now we got the building. Right. Come on. You see, yeah. because if people had the mentality, I'm just going to hold on to my money. I'm going to get, I'm going to shop. I'm going to get the cheapest. I'm going to get the lowest. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. I was talking, I was talking to a, a contractor and he said, Nancy, he said, when we do, when we do the castle, he said, let me advise you something. He says, I'll get multiple bids from subcontractors. I said, stop right there. I said, don't you ever bring me the lowest bid. That's right. I'm not looking for the cheapest job. It's cheaper to pay more. Because you get it done right. You don't have to do it twice. And he said, I am so glad to hear you say that. Because he said, I'm in the midst right now. They took the cheapest bid. And I have to go in and rebuild an entire city building. Because they took the cheapest and did it wrong. See, my job is not to save money. My job is to fulfill the plan with excellence. And let me tell you what, God funds excellence. He is not, he is not offended that you paid more to get it better, to make it better. Jesus told Dad Hagen in a vision, he said, my people... The church ought to be the nicest building in the city. You don't become the nicest building in the city saving money, trying to hold back and do as little as you can. Now, don't misunderstand me. As we grow spiritually, then our level of excellence grows. God funds excellence. And I am not looking for the cheapest route because that can be the most expensive by far in the long run. I want the plan and I want it done right. I want it to be an example of how to fulfill a plan. Amen.
don't misunderstand me. There have been times as we were growing, I mean, we had to eke out everything we could out of every dollar. Yeah. Don't misunderstand me while our faith was growing and our minds were being renewed. But if you think right, those seasons don't last. You step into a flow of abundance. Because until you think right, you're not safe with abundance. And and, and, and when we would forfeit the plan to save money, we don't think right. <laughs> Listen, you know this yourself. You wouldn't give amounts of big amounts to kids who didn't think right. I mean, somebody will hand the grandkids, you know, they'll hand them some money for their birthday or something, and we turn around and say, hand that to me. Yeah. <laughs> hand that to me. Because you'll go out there and buy 49 parfaits out of the cafe. Yeah, they'll feed everybody. Hey, come up here and get a parfait. Come up here and get a parfait. We wanted to be generous, but that wasn't the purpose of why it was given to them. And they'll misuse it. And they'll use it for the wrong purpose. Yeah. Yeah. Buy, have Pokemon cards, but my gosh, 900 of them, it's a limit. <laughs> we want you to have what you enjoy, but we will not let you misuse what's for the plan. The same thing is with God. He wants you to have what you enjoy, but when you start misusing what's intended for the plan. But if you're money-minded, you tend to misuse it and withhold from the plan. It's all about the plan. Amen. It's not my call to save money. It's my call to fulfill the plan. And I'm not talking about being wasteful. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not talking about mishandling money that you don't understand uh, with, um, with the finances of the church. This is the holy tithe of these people. We'll get everything out of it that belongs to it. We won't treat that lightly and be wasteful. And we won't mishandle it and give it to places it shouldn't be. But still, again, I'm not motivated by the money. I'm motivated by the plan. Hallelujah. Listen, our own resources are never enough for what came out of the greatness of God. God is so great that our income could never fund his greatness. He's the only one that can fund it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. We're not sponsoring his plan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when your pastor stands up and receives an offering for a project, he's not asking you to sponsor the project. He's offering you the opportunity to get in on a flow that God's funding. And then you step into a divine flow when you participate in that. Amen. One of the greatest things that my husband taught us, especially the family, because we saw the inner workings of things. And the day he died, I said, one of the greatest things Ed taught us was how to look at nothing and keep going. Yes, exactly right. Because we knew it wasn't about the money. Yeah. It wasn't about what was there or wasn't there. It was about the plan. And that man constantly did everything with nothing. <laughs> I saw it time and time and time again. Amen. Praise the Lord. The key to prosperity that belongs to you is follow the Spirit. He shows the plan. He reveals the plan. And when you understand that your abundance, your success is tied to the plan, it's not the plan you figure out. You have to learn to be led by the Spirit into that plan. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Long before your need ever showed up, yeah. he fully funded that need. Yeah. He fully funded that need. Hallelujah. Um, <clears throat> not long after Ed went home to be with the Lord, I, uh, of course, I became responsible for 
uh, the things that needed to be dealt with. And uh, there was six and a half million dollars to deal with. I needed at least a million immediately. And then about two weeks after he went home to be with the Lord, I, uh, there was a big envelope sitting on my desk that I got in the mail. It was a love letter from the IRS, and <laughs> they love me so much. <laughs> and I had no idea what was in it because Ed handled things, you know. And before I even opened it, I held it up and said, Father, I want you to know I thank you that this has a supply. Yeah. I start talking about the supply before I start talking about the need. My God shall supply all your needs. What's listed first? We're need-minded, and he's trying to turn us supply-minded by talking about the supply that's for the need. Amen. So I held that envelope up, and I said, I want you to know I'm so thankful for the supply. I didn't expect this, but your supply already planned it. And I'm so glad I opened, when I opened it, I had already said something. I had already chosen something. Because it was six figures. And I didn't do anything about it. And within a couple of weeks, they contacted us back and they just kept lowering and lowering. I didn't call them and nothing. B by the time we were done, they said, you only owe 18000 uh, Why? Because the supply, yeah, the supply. kicked in. Come on. Yes. Glory to God. I go, cheap. That's cheap. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. When Brother Copeland talks about when he went through his building and he was telling giving a tour to partners or different ones in the, that had come to see the building. And he said, you know, we were going to do this, but we were able to do this instead. And we were going to do this, but we were able to do this instead. And, and he said, I went through the building proving to the people that I had not wasted anything, which is, it's appropriate to be, uh, to be up front. But he said, after they left, he said, God said, I want to talk to you. And he said, okay. And he said, uh, you were telling all the people where you saved money doing this and saved money doing that, cutting this out and not doing that. And he said, since you saved all that money, where is it? He said, well, I don't have it. He said, yeah, because you didn't save money. You cheated what was in your heart. Amen. When you build, when you renovate, when you buy, uh, follow your heart. Follow your heart. Follow your heart. Turn with me, if you would, to Psalm chapter 77. Psalm chapter 77. Psalm chapter 77, verse 14, the Amplified Classic. <clears throat> this is referring to when God delivered his people out of Egypt. Psalm 77, verse 14. You are the God who does wonders. <laughs> you have demonstrated your power among the peoples. You have with your mighty arm redeemed your people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph. Verse 16, when the waters at the Red Sea and Jordan saw you, O God, they were afraid. The deep shuddered also, for all the waters saw you. Your need has already seen God. The clouds poured down water. The skies sent out 
a sound of rumbling thunder. Your arrows went forth in forked lightning. The voice of your thunder was in the whirlwind. The lightnings illumined the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way in delivering your people was through the sea. His way was through the sea. Their way would have been through the land. If they're scouting out a path, they're looking at what they see, the land. They're not looking at what they don't see, the land under the sea. Your way, your way, your way, not man's way, your way. God's way of delivering you is never the route you uh, formulated. In fact, once you form a way, that's one he's not using. The moment you plan how this is all going to work out, that's why he will not use it. Why? Because his ways are higher than your ways. And when you form a way, that's a way he's not using. Because if you can form it, it's beneath him. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Now, if we will follow his ways, we get to come up into his ways. If we will take his thoughts, we get to come up into his thoughts. But no, what you figured out is low. It's not high enough. Verse 19, your way in delivering your people was through the sea. And your paths through the great waters. Yet your footsteps were not traceable, but were obliterated. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Look at this. Your footsteps were not traceable. Notice this. His footsteps were there. But they were hidden by the water. Before they got there. He walked it. Before they got there, he walked it while his footsteps were there. He walked it. He walked it. All Moses was doing was revealing the footsteps. When he held out the rod, the waters parted. Now they saw the path. Now they saw the plan. Now they saw the steps because he had already walked it. And you say, when did he walk it? I mean, did he walk it like an hour before they got there? Did he walk it a day before they got there? Go with me back to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 3. The Amplified Classic Translation. Hebrews 4, verse 3. For we who have believed, adhered to and trusted in and relied on God, do enter that rest in accordance with his declaration that those who did not believe should not enter rest, should not enter when he said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Now, he's talking about the people he delivered from Egypt. He said, they shall not enter my rest. Look at this. This is what I want to focus on. And this he said, although his works had been completed and prepared and waiting for all who would believe. What, look at this. From the foundation of the world. When did his footsteps get placed in the Red Sea? From the foundation of the world. Not the day before. When was your supply provided? The foundation of the world. Not yesterday. Not when you got billed. Why? Because God is so far in front of your need. He is so far in front. Now we can see this. Go back with me to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. The Amplified Classic again, translation. Ephesians 2, verse 10. For we are God's own handiwork. His workmanship 
Well, what is that? What does that mean? The next phrase tells us recreated in Christ Jesus. That's his handiwork. He recreated us in Christ Jesus. Born anew. Why did he do that? That we may do those good works which God predestined, planned beforehand for us. Now look at this. He planned it beforehand for us. Now is our, comes our responsibility. Taking paths. That's us. Taking paths. Taking what he planned. Walking out what he planned. Not what we planned, what he planned. Taking paths which he prepared which he prepared. Now see, when he says he prepared, if this aisle represents his path, his plan, there's not just the path planned, there's the every provision on that path. Yeah. And as we take that path, yeah. we're to take the provision. Yeah. We gather up the provision, we gather up the answers, we gather up the supply with our faith. Why? Because it's already there. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if you're going to go over here and walk the plan, that you formed. There's a path. You can take your path. You can take it. But you know what's on there? You. That's it. That's it. That's it. What, how many hours you can work? How many customers you can get? Just you on that plan, on that path. He's prepared nothing over here. That's right. All preparation is on his path. So it's not hard. Choose life or choose death. Choose blessing, choose cursing, choose life. He said, I said it before you. Now he says this, taking paths which he prepared. Now, settle down on that. He's prepared. He has prepared for everything that he has, he has committed to my trust. Every home every business, every building for the church, every project, everything of my call, he has fully prepared. He prepared. Amen. Look at this. But when did he prepare? Ahead of time. Before time started being measured. He didn't just mean ahead of time like last week. Ahead of time last month. Before time started being measured in eternity, when he was still in eternity, He's always in eternity. But before time started being calculated by, uh, by, by the movements of this earth, he already prepared and planned and provided. And what did it say in Hebrews? Waiting for all those who would believe. Yes. When did he walk that Red Sea? Before time started being measured. Now, is there really room for worry? <laughs> is there really room for I'm just I'm not worried Pastor Nancy I'm concerned yeah that's what I'm saying that's right. when your mind is renewed do you understand when your mind is renewed that he's already prepared it all before time ever started clicking it was completely prepared all it's waiting is for me to show up it's waiting for me to arrive with my faith this is the victory that overcomes the world, even my faith. My victory is waiting for my faith to show up. Your supply is waiting for your arrival, your arrival of faith. Amen. Get rid of the idea that I've got to get it. It's already prepared. It's already prepared. Every building you ever need, every resource you ever need, every piece of equipment you ever need, every airplane that you're going to need to fulfill, what, everything, it's already prepared. You don't got to get it. You just got to stay with the plan that the resources are on. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You've heard me tell the story, but what a, I so love, I so love, uh, when you start dealing with the supernatural, there's an element of mystery. And that's what makes it so supernatural. <laughs> and uh, when my husband and I moved out here in 1991, 1990, we started the church in 91, and uh, we rented a home. We did not have the finances to purchase something, and we really didn't want to purchase something up front because we weren't acquainted with the area. Everything was new. Everything was developing, so we rented a home that had been newly built 
but no one had ever lived in it. It was a blessing. It was a help. And Ed was, Ed, Ed was not a renter. There was nothing in him that was a renter. It was all about ownership. God will turn you into owners. Why? Because when you own something, the devil's plan is done on that piece of property. God wants you to own things. You follow God. I'm not telling you to go out and buy stuff. I'm saying that the mentality, the mentality is, is God will turn you into an owner. And uh, so we rented a home. And uh, <laughs> Ed was talking about buying a home. Now, I did the finances for us personally. I did it for the ministry and stuff. Ed, Ed, Ed never came in and said, what we got in this account or what we got in that account. He'd just come and tell me what was in his heart. That's, what, that's the way he functioned. And uh, so he, uh, he would talk about buying a, buying a home. And I would, you know, I knew that we didn't have, let me just say this. I, I didn't have money to buy postage stamps, a book of postage stamps. <laughs> Thank you for that holy laugh. Because <laughs> she's been there. That was the laugh of having seen that place. <laughs> And uh, he got up one morning. We've been here for two years. February, February of 1993. And he came in. He would get up early in the morning, go to the 7-Eleven down the corner, get his cup of coffee, get his USA Today. And so he came back and he threw down a housing magazine that showed all the homes available in the area. And he came in and he threw it down on the kitchen counter and he said, when I saw the front cover of that, God said to me, there's your house. It was on the cover of that magazine. So I said, well, when are you going to look at it? He said, today. Everything to, with Ed was today. <laughs> Everything was today. And uh, so he called and got hold of a, a real estate guy that was in our church and said, I want to see such and such house. He said, okay. And so we went and saw it. And it was a, we had a rain, a huge rain during that time. In fact, they showed, they showed pictures in the newspaper of boats down Old Town, Old Town Murrieta. They were, they were riding boats through. That's how much flooding had happened. And so it always marked that time for me. So in that rain, we went up and we saw this house. And it was just a formality to see it because God had already said it. So we walked in and says, yep, that's it. Yep, that's it. And so he tells the realtor, find out who, who owns his house. He comes back the next day or so and said, well, there's a woman in the L.A. area that it's an investment home that she built it two years ago. It was built two years ago. It's never been lived in. No one's ever purchased it. It has sat here empty. So it was built the year we arrived. And um, so it had been sitting there. What was it waiting? Waiting for our arrival. Waiting for our faith to show up. Yes. And so, um, why? Because God is so far in front. Yes. And so, um, he said, well, get hold of her. I, I want to talk to her. And uh, so, there were two sons of hers. They were in their 40s and 50s that came down and met with Ed and said, well, uh, mom owns this, but we handle her business. And so, uh, we've come down to meet with you. And he said, well, God told me. This is what he said. He didn't ask him, are you a Christian? He said, God told me that's my home. Yeah. And he said, I, I love this about Ed. He was not a shucker and a jiber. He didn't play games. He didn't try to cloud over anything. And he didn't try to make things appear differently than they were. He said, God told me that's my home. I don't have any money. <laughs> <laughs> what can you do to get me in that home? What can you do to get me in that home? And they said, well, we can't offer you anything that's not ours. It belongs to our mother. He said, and they said, we'll go back and talk to her mother. He said, okay, let me know what she says. So they go back to the mother and they say, mom, there is a preacher in Murrieta who wants to buy that home. She said, what's his name? She sa they said, his name is Ed Dufresne. She said, 15 years ago, I went to his church in Torrance, California, and God healed me in his service. Do whatever you got to do to get him in that home. See, 
It's not about money. It has nothing to do with money. God prepared 15 years ago. God healed her because there was a divine connection that the man of God's going to need something. Exactly right. Come on. And he committed her to his plan, to be a part of that plan. If we would have waited for the money to show up before we would have progressed, we would have never found her. We would have never known there was a woman with a miracle waiting with a supply. And she told her sons, whatever you got to do, get him in that home. And you know what they said? They said, what can you pay? They asked us, what can you pay? And Ed said, well, I can pay this. And he, they said, okay, you pay that. And then Ed said, in two years, I'll pay you this or whatever. He did it with the lease option. Uh -huh. yeah. And then I'll pick up the option. Then we bought it. And uh, then uh, when the housing market was at a, at a high in 2005, we sold it for a million dollars more than we paid for it. <laughs> Why? That's the plan. That's the plan. That's the plan. The variable is not, will the money be there? Will you show up for the plan? That's the variable. Praise the Lord. The plan's already fully formed, fully provided for, fully planned. It's all intact. It's waiting for you to work it, waiting for you to take the path, take the path, take the path. Amen. Stand with me to your feet. Father, we thank you this morning. For right thinking of the word. Your word helps us to think right. We are the prosperous. We're not trying to get prosperous. Things don't make us rich. We are rich in him. Who we are in him is rich. We thank you. 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 <laughs> Every need is already provided. No more living this life need-minded. We are supply-minded. We are provision-minded. We have a supply. You have already provided. And we rejoice our way into the flow of that provision. We thank you. Done worrying about money done having wrong conversations around the dinner table, hashing, rehashing, planning, replanning. If it's in your heart, if it's in your heart, follow it. Amen. Hallelujah. We had this kind of example in my husband. Many of you got to partake and see him, see him work that. And I tell you what, when you have a need, remember what you saw. Amen. 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 Remember that example and that demonstration of it. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, we're so grateful. We are so, so grateful.